So if you have your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 1. Uh, we're going to start from verse 5, uh, verse 5 all the way through verse 16. And once again, if you have downloaded our church app, uh, you can go into the notes section there and you can just follow along. And one of the things I've been encouraging you is after you take notes, just kind of save it and just you have a whole treasure box of notes and insights that God spoke to you with and spoke to you about. And then later on, and some of you will probably move on and you might have to lead a Bible study somewhere. You might have to do something. You have a whole bunch of notes now that you could look at and as a reference. So we want to try to empower you, equip you, and give you everything that you need so that you could become the ministers of the gospel wherever God sends you. If you haven't, because you're new or you haven't done so, you're able to do that. Just go on any of the Apple Store or the Google Play and download our church app, uh, HMCC of Hong Kong, and you'll get it there. And uh, and you're going you're gonna to need it today because I'm going to do something. Hopefully it will work. If it doesn't, then... It's okay. Uh, failure is our greatest teacher. Can I get a good amen to that? Don't ever be afraid to try. It's a good thing. I'm wondering how many of you uh, have heard of the Enron scandal of 2001. Anybody just raise your hand so I'll know. Okay. Uh, a handful of you. In fact, it, this is a very important story because in many of the business schools around the world and those different schools that teach on ethics and leadership, this story of the Enron situation, the scandal that happened in 2001, is one of the top cases that people look at to learn what went wrong. Those of you who might not know, Enron was a large energy company that was based in Houston, Texas. And just through various accounting uh, misdeeds, what happened was the company had to file for bankruptcy. That, that wasn't the worst part of it because there were so many people who put all of their life savings into this company. And therefore, because they filed for bankruptcy, many of these people lost everything. All the years of serving and all the years of uh, giving to this company, all their investments were completely gone. And many of them, uh, their lives were turned for the worse and some even committed suicide because of that situation. So what I wanted to do is, this is a very important lesson on leadership. I want to show you a quick clip so that you kind of understand at least hearing and visually seeing some of the different players that were involved in the situation, as well as the situation at hand, what caused this downfall of this enormous energy company uh, in the United States. So let's watch this together. I don't know how that guy had that kind of perspective in light of losing everything in his life. But now as he started his own company and now is being generous as supporting different charities, uh, it's really about perspective. But I think the key thing that I want us to understand is this. This is just one example of so many other leadership failures. And it comes in all different forms. And I don't know about you, but it's times like this where you start thinking to yourself, do you really want to be a leader? The, the weight and the responsibility that you have. But one of the things you have to realize is whether you want to be a leader or not, many of you are going to be placed in positions of influence. Once you become a parent, you are now a leader. Whether you are the husband or the wife or the father or the mother, you are now leading your children. It's not something that you might want to do, but you have to do because they're going to look to you. Some of you who are in different work projects or even those of you who are taking care of different assignments in school, whatever it may be, that you have the opportunity to influence people around you, even in our church. You might not have a position or a title, but you influence people. And the question is, do you influence people for the good or for their bad. And so what I wanted to do this morning, a little bit different from what I normally do, is I want to take a poll, because I want to know who it is that I'm speaking to, because I'm just wondering how many of us have been in these leadership positions, and so that this will help us to understand what we talk about today has relevance. And so if you have your phones, you could click onto the 
uh, church app, and there's a link that directly leads you to the poll. If some of you have not downloaded the amp, uh, app, you could actually scan the QR code, see right here, and then go ahead and scan that, and then we'll have you uh, take the poll. So here are the three questions that I want us to answer, and then this will also help you who is in this room, who are the people that are in this room to give you a better idea of why this topic of leadership is so important as we talk about the second part in the book of Titus. So the first question is this. How many of you have been in a leadership role, whether at work or in school? So that's the first question. How many of you have been in a leadership role at school or in work, whether overseeing a project or leading a group assignment? So this is what we're getting at. So this is a, a lot of people. That means that many of you who might not necessarily have a position or a title, uh, many of you are influencers and you do it at work. You do it at school. The second question is this. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being fully prepared, how many of you felt like you were prepared to take on the leadership role? So let's see the next question here. I don't know how encouraging that is. We'll give it about a couple more seconds for some of you to respond. So if you look at this, you realize that there are a lot of people who are placed in leadership roles or influencing roles that they're not really well prepared. And no wonder sometimes the projects don't go really well. And no wonder some of those group assignments never get done until the deadline. And then you're like, oh my God, my grade is on the line. And then one person ends up doing everything, which is usually you, right? Don't you hate that? Or some of you are like, no, that's not me because you don't do anything and you let someone else do it because you're already getting A. Maybe that's you. So 5.8 is the average number of people feeling pretty well prepared to lead. Now here's another question I think is important. How many of you have been hurt or disappointed by a person in a leadership role? Some of you are in that number is like, because Pastor Seth, you know, and so you're putting, putting it in there. But think about it. Almost majority of you have been in some form of leadership role or influencing people. And you don't feel really well prepared for it. Maybe just average. And then we see here that many of us have been hurt or disappointed by some leader or somebody with some kind of role of leadership in our lives. I think if anything, just taking this poll in this room right now, it shows us why we need good leadership and why we need to be committed and growing in leadership so that we can impact the world. We will never be able to impact the world when our leadership or our influence level is low. And I think this is what the Apostle Paul understood as he wrote this letter to Titus. Now, I want to make sure that we're clear when we talk about leadership. When I mention leadership, we have to remember it is not about positions and titles. This is something that I'm constantly trying to rewire people's brains because we always think that leadership is about positions and titles. And so if you don't have that position, if you don't have that role, you say to yourself, then I'm not a leader, so I don't have to do much. But you need to understand to change your mindset to say leadership is about influence. And everybody has influence. Let me give you an example. You encounter something, your emotions are affected. You have a really down spirit or very depressive spirit. Your attitude is really negative and you walk into life group. I guarantee you, you are going to affect the people in your life group. Whether you see yourself as a leader or not, your attitude begins to pervade and influence the life group. So in that sense, you're a leader because you're influencing a group of people. Same way at work. Like how we do things, with the attitude that we do things, that will affect people, even though you're not the boss, 
Even though you're not the manager and you have the role and the position to influence people going this way, you can actually influence people in multi-direction. Ken Blanchard in his book, Leader Your Family Like Jesus, or Lead Your Family Like Jesus, writes this. Anytime you seek to influence the thinking, behavior, and development of people in their personal or professional lives, you take on the role of a leader. This is very important. It's not about positions or titles, but once again, if you are influencing the thinking, the behavior, and the development of people, whether it's personal or professional, then you are playing the role of a leader. So as we talk about leadership, we have to remember it's about influence. So therefore, we got to rethink about the question. is how are we influencing people around us in our workplace, in our families, in our neighborhoods? So as we talk about the importance of good leadership today, uh, I pray that we will be able to understand why we need to influence those around us with the gospel message. So I'm going to talk about two specific things. As we notice in this passage in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, all the way through verse 16, there are two things that I'm going to highlight for us. The first is I want to talk about the leadership criteria. The leadership criteria. Let's go ahead and read verse 5 as we get started here in Titus chapter 1. It says this, This is Apostle Paul speaking as he wrote this letter. He says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So let me just pause here and comment on verse 5 to help us to understand this whole idea of leadership criteria. We notice that the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus and he's reminding him of the purpose why he was left behind. Because it's easy to forget your purpose in life. But here's Paul saying, Titus, remember why I left you behind in Crete. And simply Paul wanted Titus to provide leadership to the struggling church in Crete. Because it was not properly organized. One of the things you have to understand is that there was a lot of confusion. And uh, you'll see this from the rest of this letter as we study this book together. But we will see there was a leadership void. And because of that, because Paul knew that he wasn't able to establish it with good leadership, he now left Titus behind and so that he will be able to do the things that needs to be done in order to have a church that is healthy and doing some great things. This is another good reminder of how important good leadership is to the church or to any organization. I want you to notice here in verse 5, the phrase, put what remained in order or into order. This can be translated as to straighten things out or to set things in order. So Titus was supposed to obey this directive by appointing elders. And he was supposed to do it in every single town. Now, it was Paul Paul's policy to ordain leaders. So he will go into a city, preach the gospel, and once they come to know Jesus Christ, he will disciple them. And you see in different cities, he stayed sometimes a year, sometimes he stayed for three years. But in that time, he will be discipling people, Christ followers. And then what will happen is that he will then pick people and then ordain them as elders who are the leaders of the church. This was his MO. This is what he did every single time he will go into a city. And then when you see this, you realize because, as I mentioned before, he was only there for a short period of time. He did not have the time to develop these leaders. Now, another thing that I want you to notice is a phrase, every town, which indicates that there are various house churches all throughout the city on this island of Crete. Now, if you think about this for a moment, there are many different house churches all over this island. And so therefore, they needed different leaders for each of these different house churches around different parts of the island. Which once again, emphasizes the importance of having good leadership. Because if you have good leadership just here, but not over here, then it's going to affect the overall body of Christ. And so the elders, what they would do is they would play the important role of giving leadership 
to all these churches. And therefore, Paul wanted Titus to clearly pick out, use these criteria in order to pick some of these elders. So we're going to look into it. We're not going to have time to look into all the different traits, but I want you to just see why Paul is giving these traits as criteria for leadership. Let's go ahead and read verse 6 through 9 as we establish what's happening here. It says this, If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So let's go ahead and look in this section here in verse 6 through 9. It is important to note that some of the criteria for being an elder is very similar to what Paul mentioned to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. You can just make a little note of that, but you'll notice that there are similar criteria and similar traits of being an elder or a leader in the church. I want you to notice the phrase above reproach. Why is this important? Because it is translated as blameless. So anyone who is a leader or a person of influence has to be above reproach or blameless. Now, I want to make sure that we're clear on this. Because if we see blameless mean, meaning that there is no sin, that there is not a single person in this room, myself included, that can actually lead. This does not mean that the leader have to live a perfect life. That is not what Paul is saying. But rather, it should not be that there are people who can accuse them of doing something wrong. So I want to make sure that we're clear on this. If there are people who can clearly state that there are certain character flaws of this person, it is clear that they should not be a leader. And this is one of the reasons why we try to uphold as best as possible in our church of what it means to be a leader, to represent Christ, to help God's people, to understand their destiny for their lives. It's because it's not just about how much you know. And this is the problem that I've seen time and time again in so many other churches, in so many other organizations. And some of you know what that feels like. A lot of times people will be put in leadership because they have a a lot of knowledge. Don't raise your hand, but I'm wondering how many of you have seen those people that just have studied the Bible. They know so much about, about, about the Bible. They're really sharp people. But you look at their lives and you realize that there's an inconsistency. What they know and how much they know and how they live their lives is completely a disconnect. And that is what Paul is trying to say. Do not put people in leadership just because of how much they know. But it's really about who they are in their character that's more important. Uh, Those of you who are working, I think some of you know some of the worst examples of poor or good examples of poor leadership is when there are people who are above you or who have power to make decisions just because they've been in the company for a long time. If you've ever worked with someone who's incompetent, but they just are in leadership position just because of the title, because they've been in this company for a very long time, you know that it drives you crazy. Because they have no idea what they're talking about. You do, but you're like a little peapod, and you're just like, okay, I can't do anything. But you understand that here's this person who's over you, but they are clueless, and they are so incompetent in what they do. And you're like, how did they get there? Have you ever felt that? (laughs) It just drives you crazy. And so what you have to understand is the tricky part of leadership is not so much how much you know, but it's also by character. But then you see people who have good character, but they don't have the competence, and you're like, who am I supposed to follow? This is when you turn to Jesus. Jesus, you're the perfect one, perfect leader. Can I just make a comment on this? Because I think this is important for all of us to understand. Because Paul says they are above reproach, so we understand character is important. But we also have to understand that no one's perfect. Can you just somebody next to you and say, you're not perfect? I'm not perfect. 
All right. I think it's so easy to criticize and blame people for some of the smallest things because we put our own standard on people. I think when I look at my life, I, this is kind of the things that I see in my, in my own heart. I think when it's so easy, when things are going really well, I'm doing really well with God, it's easy to judge people. Because you think that you have kind of somehow have earned or you're doing this thing and you feel pretty good about yourself, which is the human paradigm. And then you start judging other people because why aren't they fasting for 20 days? You know, why, why aren't they reading the Bible like five times a day? Why aren't they doing this? So you start feeling good about yourself and then you start judging people. Or it's the opposite end, but it's the same side of the, or the same coin. And, and it's this. When you're not doing well spiritually, it is so easy to judge people. Why? Because you don't like the things that you see in yourself. So when you see other things in other people, especially when they're doing well or maybe they're not doing something, it's easier to judge. So I realize that spiritual pride comes in the form of when you think you're doing well, but also when you're not doing well and that you know you should be doing certain things and then it's easy to judge other people. These are the people who, if they're not really walking with God, they see other people really worshiping and really wanting to just live for God. They go, well, look at them. They think they're so spiritual. So that's judging but you're doing it out of your own insecurities because you're not doing well spiritually. Can I get a good amen to that? So it's the both ends that we see. Frederick Robertson says this in his book, Sermon Priest on Brighton. He says, experience tells us that each man most keenly and unerringly detects in others the vice with which he is most familiar himself. Wow. Whatever vice that you have, it is so easy to spot it in other people, and that's what you use to judge. I think this is why we need to take a humble posture when it comes to influencing others, or it will almost always lead to hypocrisy. Matthew Henry, in his commentary of the whole Bible, says this, Those that boast most of the religion may be suspected of partiality and hypocrisy in it. What he's simply saying is that those of us who live for religion, it's all about the do's and don'ts, then what that does is that it always leads us to this hypocrisy that we don't even see, see in ourselves. That's why we have to constantly fight the urge to have this human paradigm which is so fueled by a religious spirit. We have to kill it. But rather we have to have this mindset of a fighter to have this gospel paradigm in all that we do. What that simply means is that we will be forgiving and gracious to others as God has been forgiving and gracious to us. That's the gospel paradigm. We will not judge other people because if God were to judge us in light of what we do in private, we should be condemned and the wrath of God should be upon us. That's how you know if you're operating on the gospel paradigm or the human paradigm. It keeps you humble because you see all the stuff in other people that you don't like, but we fail to see the wickedness in our own hearts and how we fall short. How about us this morning? Are we operating out of this gospel paradigm or are we operating from the human paradigm when it comes to becoming being more blameless, above reproach? Now, I want to establish that because what I wanted to do and help us to understand is there is no perfect leader except for Jesus. And it's easy to judge. It's easy to feel like, oh, I'm not that good, so I can't really influence people. And Satan will sideline you. And as we continue, just even in these verses, of verse 6 through 9, it's important to note that Paul brings in a leader's family life as a foundation for the leadership for the church. Now, I know some of you, this might not totally relate or you cannot understand it, but I want you to try to understand it for your future reference. He mentions that not only does a leader has to have one wife, but that his children are believers and not given over to debauchery or insubordination. 
listen to the New Living Translation of that part. It says this, His children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. Now, those of you who are parents and you have a family, you understand that sometimes you try so hard to control your child, but they're out of control. There's so many times where you might cross that line and become a little bit maybe abusive, either psychologically, physically, and we know that that is completely wrong according to Scripture. We also know those of you who are kids and you have parents, you know that you have been recipients of sometimes poor parenting. The reason why Paul mentions this about the family life, why is that important for church leadership, is that he wants us to consider this logically. Listen to me carefully. If a person cannot lead within his home, how will he be able to lead in the context of the church? So let me be more specific. If a person cannot win his own kids to Christ, which is, talks about that kids have to be believers, how will he be expected to win others to Christ who are not part of his family? That's the logic. If a person can't keep his own children in order, how will he be able to lead other people in the church when they have wild and maybe rebellious and crazy living? So once again, good leadership starts from the home, which is the smaller unit. So can I just pause here and maybe more of an encouragement to some of you? A lot of times some of you aspire for great positions and titles to do great things impacting the world. Before you start thinking of those things, which I think are good, look at your life with where you are right now. Look at your family life. How are you leading your wife? How are you partnering together with your husband? How are you leading your children? Some of you are like, well, that's not for me because I'm not married. I want to be married, but I'm not married and I want to have kids, but please get married and have kids. But, uh, you know, I, I don't have kids and so you're just forgetting. But I want you to listen. How's your relationship with your parents? Because how you relate with your parents will show you how you're going to relate with people in authority in the church. Some of you have been so hurt by your parents. Any authority figure, whether it's your life group leader or your pastor, or whoever it may be, you totally disrespect them because that's how you do it with your parents. In the same way, some of you, you just do what you're told. You don't think. That's not a good leader. There have been a lot of historical events that happened with a lot of atrocities where people just did things because they were told to do it. So now when there's a leader in the church that tells you to do something, you just do it without thinking. So to be a good leader, I want to encourage you, start with where you are right now and ask, how is my relationship with my kids? How is my relationship with my family, my parents? How is my relationship with my friends? Are they influencing me to do things that I don't want to do or am I influencing them more towards Christ and the things of the kingdom of God? To think through this and say, how am I influencing my life group? Am I the one who's always pulling us away from the main goal? Like trying to make a joke. I don't mind making jokes. But you totally distract everything. You're not being a good influence. I mean, I'm wondering, what are some things right now that you can do to develop the influence level in your life so that if God in his grace desires to give you more positions of influence in the future, that because you've built your character, you've worked on some of these things. That's what Paul is saying is that if you cannot lead your family, how in the world are you going to lead the family of God? So with this being said, we have to understand that a lot of godly people have kids that are out of control. I think the one prominent story is about Billy Graham, where his son Franklin Graham, who actually came back to the Lord and now leads a big ministry, is that he, during his teenage years, he totally turned away from the faith because he did not want to do what his father did because his father was traveling so much. But he's a godly man, or was a godly man, Billy Graham. So sometimes, even though you might be a godly person, 
you have to understand that you can't control your kids. They will just do what they want. So you just got to pray for them. You got to love them. If any of you have kids who are wayward to just pray for them, what else can you do? So that's why we have to not be so quick to judge. Especially when we see family life not completely in order. But yet we have to be able to use that and understand where that are because different situations for different people. Then he goes on to say that there are 17 qualification traits that are listed in two categories. This will help us to summarize it quickly. There's negative traits and positive traits. So the negative traits. In verse 7, we see Paul switches from an elder to an overseer. Now, pretty much, they're pretty much the same words. They're interchangeable. And this time, Paul mentions that a leader is God's steward. Let me give you other translations of that concept of God's steward. In the New Living Trans, uh, in the New International Version, it says this, entrusted with God's work. So it's about being entrusted with something. The New Living Translation says a manager of God's household. So we're managing something that's not ours, but it's God's. The message translation says responsible for the affairs in God's house. So there's a sense of responsibility. So a leader is somebody who is a steward, something that has been given to them. And now they need to wield it in a way that is responsible, that is like a manager and something that is entrusted to you to be faithful to. Now, it might help to have this kind of mindset when it comes to church leadership. I think in the same way, it is helpful to see yourself as a steward at work. So once again, leadership is not a position or title. It's about influence. Those of you who are working, do you know that you are a God steward of that work? That as you go to work every single day, that you have been entrusted with something. That you are called to be responsible for something that you are managing what God has given to you as a gift and you want to do that to the best of your ability so that you can glorify Him and look for opportunities to bring Christ into your workplace. And this is where a lot of times we forget. We just get up in the morning, Monday morning, we're like, oh, work. But you're a steward. You're entrusted with something to be responsible to go to your workplace as a ministry so that you can actually share Christ that I cannot as a pastor go to, but you can. You could probably influence eight or 10 or maybe 20 some people. That is your church in that sense. That is your ministry to make a difference in their lives. You are there to serve. You're there to reflect the character of Christ. When there's backbiting or doggy dog world kind of mindset of everyone trying, but you come there with a servant attitude. Your attitude is totally different from what they come in with and they will start noticing something's different about you. When there's office gossip, you don't join in in that gossip. You try to change the topic so that you can be more positive and they realize that you're not the person that they can gossip with. So you start earning trust with them. And so that sometimes when they struggle with something, they'll come to you because they realize that you're trustworthy. Can I just give you a little side hint? Whenever someone comes to you and gossips about somebody else, they're probably gossiping about you in a different context. Can I get a good amen to that? Mm-hmm. Yep. You think, oh, if they're so nice because they're talking to me and we're gossiping about somebody else. If you're not nice or something happens, they'll gossip about you to somebody else. So watch people who are... Whatever that means. Neg- negative people. Negative traits of being arrogant, quick-tempered, a drunkard, violent, greedy with all are all qualities that can ruin your witness. When we possess these traits, it hinders us from leading well. Those are the negative traits. Here are some positive traits. In verse 8, we see good qualities a leader should have in order to lead God's people well and to be a good witness for Christ. The positive traits of being hospitable, lovers of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined are important when it comes to earning trust and leading well. Look at every single one of these things. When you begin to grow in it and possess more of it, you realize that this earns trust and you begin to lead well. And then in verse 9, Paul mentions how important that a leader knows the Word of God. It is so important that the leader is able to encourage others with the teaching of God's Word 
as well as to rebuke those who contradict it. That's why I want to encourage you, some of you right now, you might not have a leadership position in the church, but you're influencing in different measure or different ways. But right now, think of yourself in the process. Because when I think about our church, we need more leaders. We need more people to take on different ministries and to lead it and to make a greater impact so we can reach more people with the gospel message. That means right now, do your BRPs, do your SOAP, study the word of God, let it be a part of you so that when you do, if God in his grace opens that door for you, you can actually use his word that you've invested in, that your mind has been renewed in, and you'll use that to help guide people, counsel them, lead them towards the heart of God. I'm wondering how about for some of us here, when we think about these traits, how does it make you feel? I'm wondering what areas have you seen growth in the last several months or even this past year? I hope we're growing in these positive traits. Do we see more of the character of Christ that's being formed in us as we see the responsibility of influencing people around us? These are the leadership criteria that we see. Let me close out with the second point is this. Not only the leadership criteria, but I want to talk about this leadership commitment. Let's read verse 10 through 12. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Christians, a prophet of their own, said, Christians are um, always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now, I, I, I don't know if this is a nice thing to say, but right away we see why the exhortation of verse 9 earlier about holding firmly to God's word and being able to teach uh, with sound doctrine, why that's important. There were false teachers who gained access to the families within the church. So Paul simply labeled them as part of the circumcision party who infiltrated the church Throughout Paul's time, he always had to deal with these Judaizers and these people who would be so religious. They would add, you could be a Christian, but you got to do all these things, these rules, these laws. And that's why they insisted, these circumcision party, these Judaizers, they would insist that in order for you to be a genuine believer, that you have to observe all the Jewish laws. And it was a works mentality. And Paul strongly fought against this this teaching. It was Jewish legalism. And so here's Paul. He describes these teachers as false teachers, as insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, and makes it very clear in verse 11 that they must be silenced because of the damage that they're creating in the church. The worst part of this was that these Judaizers were making money off this. They were going into these house churches and they were taking families and totally indoctrinating them with negative things and and believing, well, maybe I'm not saved because I haven't done all these Jewish laws and Jewish things. And then they will be so thankful that these guys would then receive money from people. So they were making a profit of teaching false doctrine in the church. No wonder Paul was so upset. To emphasize a point, Paul quoted from one of the Christian prophets. Even they themselves saw themselves as lazy and evil people. And I think this is oftentimes in these situations where good leadership once again is needed. I'm wondering how many of us have been in a situation where your boss or your manager is addressing, is not addressing an issue that is happening that's affecting your team at work. Like, think about that for a moment. You're seeing all this stuff. There's low morale. Things are not getting done. The project at work that you're supposed to do is not getting addressed. And your leader is doing nothing. Like, it drives you crazy. You're like, this is affecting our productivity. This is affecting our bottom line. And here's this manager and this boss who, because either they're a people pleaser or they are afraid of people quitting or whatever, they don't say anything. That's poor leadership. And that's why it begins to affect people. 
So here's Paul saying these people cannot influence people in the church because it's killing the church. And then as we close in verse 13 through 16, listen to what he says as he continues. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Wow. This is a commitment to good leadership. That here are some people who are infiltrating into the church and ruining the church. Paul says, Timothy, you got to do something. Don't just sit there, do something. Because if you don't do anything, it's going to affect the people of God. And he saw the seriousness of what would happen to the believers and the families if this issue was not addressed. That's why he says, rebuke them sharply. Don't just rebuke them, but rebuke them sharply, even to the point of casting them out. Now, I want you to understand the end goal, and as Paul mentioned, was that they may be sound in their faith. Anything that pulls you away from the gospel, Paul is making very clear, we have to address. That's why I will address self-righteousness in our church. Because that pulls us away from the gospel. Spiritual pride, I will address. And we need to address because that pulls us away from the gospel. Because a lot of times we might look really religious, but it's a human paradigm in action. And those who are in the church, they will begin to see that you got to do something to earn this salvation or be worthy of the salvation. And that is not the gospel paradigm. Some of us who continue to live in sin, even when we do understand God's forgiveness, is that really repentance at all? Apostle Paul talks about that to the people of Corinth. He says there is worldly sorrow and there is godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow makes you depressed, you turn to yourself, and you feel like you're a failure. Godly sorrow turns to God in repentance and realize that all your hope, all your forgiveness, everything is in God. That is the gospel paradigm. So anything that pulls you away from the gospel, we have to address. That is good leadership. That is good influence in your life group and in our church. He wanted to make sure they're sound in their faith. As Paul continues, he mentions that the false teachers had their minds and consciousness defiled. Pretty much this is when people um, uh, compartmentalize. Gosh, I was trying to say the word, it just won't come up. compartmentalize their faith, their lives. So on one hand, they believe in these things, but on the other hand, they don't live it out. This is why he says to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled, nothing is pure. Jesus talked about this. Listen to me, this is important because we talked about the leadership criteria. Now we're talking about the commitment to good leadership, why we need it in the church. And he says, and when Jesus talked about when he was addressing the people of this living a double life, whether it's with fasting or with praying or even tithing or giving, because he was addressing all those Pharisees who try to fast to make sure everyone looks at them or try to pray to make sure that everyone understands that they're so close to God because they use all this flowery language. Listen to what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 to 23 in the New Living Translation. And once again, when it's bold type or when it is yellow, I want you to read it with me. Amen? Turn to somebody next to you and say, get ready to read. Only on the yellow. Here we go. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. What he's simply saying is that what we see, what comes out of our lives, 
will show what's going on in our hearts. And a lot of times we don't know how dark we are inside because of the hypocrisy. Mark chapter 7, verse 15, the New Living Translation. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. A reminder once again, it's your heart. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, and the NIV says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. That you could do all the religious stuff outside, but if your heart is not in the right place, that's why we have to have a commitment to good leadership to address the heart. We, we Let's make a commitment. Stop looking at the actions and the out, out, uh, external things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't look at it at all. But sometimes we look at people and say, oh, they will be a good leader because they come to all our meetings. Oh, they're a good leader because whenever we ask them to help, they help out a lot. And I'm telling you right now, you can have the most wicked heart and do all those things. What if you are serving and doing all this stuff because you want to gain something? What if you're doing it because you're afraid of that person and what they think about you? That's not out of a pure heart. And so often, all we see is the external things, and we get fooled. So there has to be this commitment to constantly work on the heart. That's good leadership. And that's why in verse 16, Paul reminds Titus that people who claim to know God, but their actions tell a different story. Do you remember 1 John chapter 2, verse 4? It says this, If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. See, no one will know that. It's the heart that God is concerned about. Listen to how the message translation translates 1 John 2, 4. And I want you to read that last part with me. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his, com- uh, doesn't keep his commandments, he is obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. We have to be committed in asking God to help us in bringing our lives into order. And as a church, we have to be committed in helping people. How about us? Do, do we allow fear to hinder us from addressing different issues in people's lives? And are we doing in love? Are we committed to God's truth and helping people to grow in their influence? So as we talk about the leadership criteria and the leadership commitment, let me give us the one thing. And the one thing is simply this, that we can grow in our leadership when we are under good mentorship. A lot of these things you will not learn on your own. You need people to model it, people to help you to grow in it, So I pray that you will grow in your leadership as you have good mentorship into your life. So let me give us some practical things to think about. First of all, you have to be proactive in seeking mentorship. Don't assume that someone's going to be picking you out from a crowd of people and say, you look like a good mentee. I want to disciple you. I want to help you. You got to seek it because that shows that you're hungry. You want to learn. You want to grow. Because you want to be a better coworker, you want to be able to go to your workplace and the in, in the workplace and be able to be a good witness there. You want to be able to go uh, to your schools and make a difference. So be proactive, seek for it, find people that you respect, find people that you're like, you know what, I like where this person is. I want to at least get there. And so then ask them. Even just have a coffee, have a a coffee. And then just say, you pray and I pay. So you pay for the coffee and let them pray over you. All right. The second thing is be patient in the leadership process. Be patient in the leadership process. You have to understand it doesn't come overnight. But it's so important that we do have good leaders and good leadership and good influence in our lives because this is going to help us to be able to be a community of faith that will make a difference. Let me just say this in closing. There are so many people who are hurting in this world. They've been hurt by people. They've been hurt by some of their stupid decisions that they made in their lives. Some of them are in bondage and wrestling and struggling through some of these issues in their lives, addictions. And a lot of times in their last ditched hope, where do they turn to? 
Sometimes they give God or the church one more chance. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a church, a life group, a community of faith, that when those types of people walk into our church, that they will be able to experience the love of God because the influence or the influencers in our church are becoming more like Jesus Christ. What we need to do is put our attention less on ourselves and more on the perfect leader that demonstrated for us all these character traits, the positive ones. And that's Jesus Christ. I pray that as you're growing in your influence, growing in your leadership, growing in your capacity to impact people around you, that people will not see you, but they'll see Christ in you. And as they do, may they be inspired and challenged to live a life that brings glory to God. May we possess more of these criteria and be committed to this leadership process because we want to see people come to know Jesus Christ.